Auto Line this week is underwritten in part by True Car and by. Did you know advanced high strength steels are the leading material used by automakers to achieve the new fuel economy standards? Advanced high strength steels are lighter in weight and reduce greenhouse gas emissions without compromising safety, performance, or affordability. Steel, a sound, sustainable investment. Today, tomorrow, and beyond. For more information, visit autosteel.org. You know why I pulled you over, ma'am? I need you to recalibrate the Doppler shift on the return signal. Radar's on the frisk. Do Sonata drivers know something you don't? The Sonata from Hyundai. And now, here is your host, John McElroy. Thank you for joining us on AutoLine this week. We're going to be diving into what's happening on the retail side of the business because my special guest today is Mike Jackson, the CEO and the chairman of AutoNation. Great having you back on the show, Mike. John, pleasure to be here. You know, I love talking about cars, so whatever you'd like to know, I'll tell you. We'll do just that, and helping me uh, ask you questions about that are Craig Trudell from Bloomberg and Steve Finley from Ward's Dealer Business, and great having the both of you here, too. Thanks, John. Well, let's start out talking about AutoNation. You guys have had a pretty good year. I was just looking at some of the numbers for your third quarter. Your revenue was up strong. Your bottom line was even stronger. And, and that got me wondering, is, is the car business that good, or are you guys benefiting from those thousands of car dealers that were closed in the Chrysler and GM bankruptcies? Well, you know, I would describe it this way, John. The U.S. economy is struggling. We have a weak, tepid, anemic recovery underway with very low GDP growth, and the job situation is still brutal out there. But the auto industry is a bright spot. And um, I would describe it this way. You know, in autos, we had a depression, not a recession, in 08, 09. Um, We had far more demand than sales because financing for vehicles dried up. We couldn't get the Lord above financed in the end of 08 and into 09. But we still had demand for around 13 million units, but could only have a selling rate of around nine. So when the recovery began, the financial institutions wanted to go back to lending, and they looked around, and they discovered an amazing thing. Uh, The number one payment in the household uh, was for the car. Consumers paid for the car before they paid for their house, before they paid for credit cards, before they paid for their children's education. So the banks wanted to lend again, but mortgages were still a mess, commercial real estate's a mess, lending to small business, too risky. And so uh, financing for vehicles is one of the first uh, parts of the financial services systems that came back to life. Uh, And then with sales having been shut down for several years, there's a genuine replacement need. And the average age of vehicles in the U.S. was pushed out to almost 11 years. So here here you have the American consumer that's been through all this. They didn't spend a lot of money maintaining their cars uh, during the crash. And um, they're at a fork in the road. They have to put two, three, four thousand dollars in the clunker or give us a down payment of two, three, four thousand dollars and get something newer. And before they want to make that decision, they come in to talk. So they come in and, and we say to them, look, we got exciting new product like you've never seen before at these price points. Uh, every manufacturer has great design. Quality is amazing. Innovation. Um, and so the customer is interested. And then we say we also have the great financing. And, and the last piece of the puzzle was gas prices. Now, gas prices are at record high levels for the past two years in history. That I would normally call out as a risk factor for auto sales and very disruptive. This time, though, we have a different proposition for the American consumer, where in the past we said, well, if you want better fuel economy, you got to buy something really expensive technology, or you have to downsize and go, go slower. It's a tough sell with Americans. The Americans don't like to go slow or go backwards. We say to them, look, you can have the same size vehicle. It goes just as fast as what you have right now with a 20 to 25 to 30 percent improvement in fuel efficiency. And a consumer says, voila, deal, I'm buying. And um, that's driven industry sales this year. It'll be over 14 million, mid 14. But we've gone from lows of selling rates in some months of under 10 
and we're on a journey back to a sustainable rate of 16, 17 million units. Well, to your point on fuel economy, why do you suppose hybrid and EV sales are as tepid as they are? Now, this is what's interesting, Steve. 70% of the customers that come into our showrooms want to talk about hybrids. 3% walk out with a hybrid. What scares them away? It's, not, it's, it's interesting. It's not that they're scared, but this American consumer from 08, 09 is very frugal and pragmatic. Kitchen table conversation. What does the technology do for me and what's the payback? And I can tell you they want their money back for efficiency technology within two to three years. That's it. When you show them a government study of what they're going to save in 15 years, they, they don't know who you're talking to. They just, 15 years, they just roll their eyes. Are you crazy? So hybrids and um, electrical, that's another whole conversation, electric cars, technical marbles all, the payback is simply too long. So, you know, 5% of the market is green, 5%. Now, what do I mean by green? That means they're willing to make a statement with their pocketbook that, is, that does not have an economic rationale in order to make a socially responsible statement. That's 5% of the market. 95% of America is pragmatic, kitchen table. What does the technology do for me and what's the payback period? And, and so the alternatives today are uh, traditional drivetrains, that uh, uh, dual overhead cams, direct injections, turbos, eight, nine, 10 speed transmissions, and, and you can get all that money back in two to three years. And the only thing we ask them to do, and this is a change, is when we talk about engines, we, in the past we would charge a premium for displacement and number of cylinders. The new consumer says, forget it. Just tell me what it does for me. And oh, by the way, it's four cylinders or six cylinders, fine. We see this in Texas. Five years ago, for us to sell a pickup truck in Texas without a V8 would be tried that. We would be questioning your manhood, you know? <laughs> uh, what are you, a wimp or something? People, people needed that big V8. 50, 60% of our pickup trucks in Texas today are six cylinders. And we'll be selling four cylinder pickup trucks within five years. So this is a breakthrough in mindset with the American consumer. So um, traditional technologies have advanced dramatically, very cost effectively. Hybrids have a trade-off in how the vehicle feels, and electrics are another whole deal Mike, way out there. Mike, I've heard you make an analogy previously to a, a challenge for the auto dealer um, that selling a fuel-efficient car is like selling broccoli, whereas you know, the bigger, uh, maybe more of uh, gas guzzlers or like selling donuts. Is that challenge still around or is that still, is that starting to, to go away now that you're having some of these, uh, you know, big pickups that have fewer cylinders or, you know, SUVs even now that are selling well, Craig, the whole cylinders? The whole key was what I first said. We've had the highest sustained price of gasoline in the history of America. Well over 350, approaching $4 a gallon for two years in a row which has kept the American consumer focused and caring about fuel economy. If gasoline prices go down to $3 a gallon, people won't care. They just don't care. Uh, and if $5 a gallon, they care more. And uh, that, that's just uh, human nature. Because again, I said to you, 95% of the equation is the payback period. Well, if gasoline is only $3 a gallon, and the new technology is $2,000, well then the payback period stretches out to six, seven years and they don't care anymore. They want the money back for the technology in two to three years, period. Are what you if, still an advocate of the uh, ga uh, increase in the gas tax or is that something that exists in the perfect world versus I would the, say, uh, trying to pass a tax? My like point that. with the gas tax for the past two decades was to say to all the ivory tower regulators, look, if you're serious about America's dependence on imported oil and saving the planet and everything. Just do what the rest of the world has, has done, tax, gasoline, and people will care about fuel economy. It'll just the cost, justify the cost of the technology, and we'll all move forward together. You can't be passionate about dealing with those issues and then at the same time run policies uh, for cheap gasoline. 
they're, that's intellectually uh, dishonest. At the moment, I would say, though, we have high gas prices and we have an economy that's in trouble. The economy in trouble trumps the gas tax at the moment. And let's see where we are in a few years. I will say, though, to, to make my point, even though we've had the highest gasoline prices in the history of America the last two years, if I take the vehicle sold in the last two years, compare them to the vehicle sold in the two years before that, when, ga when gas was cheap, we've only improved the f those vehicles by one to two miles per gallon of everything that's been sold. And, you know, the regulators would like to see us double things by 2020 or something. So we've got a long way to go. So we may need a gas tax <laughs> before we get there. Talking about technology and cars, what's your take from your customers' Uh, point of view of this infotainment or connectivity like uh, Ford, uh, my Ford Touch, Ford's gotten killed by consumer reports over that. W what are customers telling you guys about here's this what, electronic technology? Here's what the customers say. So, the smartphone is now the most important thing in their life. <laughs> uh, it has become a, an, an appendage that um, people can't go to sleep at night or get up in the morning without. Or it, drive. <laughs> or drive. That's the scary but thing. You just, said, you just said, so they want to take this smartphone into the car and everything that that smartphone provides, have it seamlessly move into the car. Now, we all know there's all kinds of safety issues, technology issues with that. But, but John, to your question, where's the consumer's head? What do they want? That's what they want. And they want that at a minimal cost to be able to bring that smartphone in. So now, everything else you do is a compromise from that. A necessary compromise, but a compromise as far as the consumer is concerned. If you push, the, push your solution uh, to something where the interface is complicated or hesitant or dysfunctional, the consumer is angry and angry fast and they just don't get why they can have this disposable smartphone that you replace eight, every 18 months and by the way they don't resent these smartphone companies that make them obsolete every there's no resentment there but when they want to come into a car that's got to last six seven years just while they own it they expect it to seamless before so it's it's i think it's a huge challenge for the uh, for the industry and those manufacturers not only for all the electronics but but the whole interface with the car uh, let's face it apple has set an expectation that you don't need an owner's manual this thick that it's intuitive how all this works and it makes you feel smart rather than make you feel stupid well, you have to make it more and more advanced, and then you have to make it simpler and simpler, which is a very much of a very challenge. Very tough challenge. But, you know, I would su suggest or argue that Ford is getting a bad rap with my Ford and other devices like that because the consumer is bringing in the driver distraction issue when they take that iPhone into their car, and they don't hook it up with the system that's available. I would tell you, uh, and I think even Ford would admit this, they... they they tried to leapfrog everybody else, which is admirable. They pushed the envelope. It ended up in the market, not bulletproof. There was a lot of issues ar around it, and they have to resolve it. And I'm sure they will resolve it. But you pay, if you push the envelope on this issue, and it doesn't work real well from the beginning, you're gonna, you are really going to get hit on customer satisfaction quick. Does the consumer just want a, a knob? And are the car makers misguided to have all these touch screens and try to kind of imitate the, the phone companies when what we're trying to do here, after all, is, is drive and, <laughs> and drive safely from point A to point B? Um, I think sometimes they go too far in moving away from knobs. You know, anytime you can have a solution where you don't have to take your eyes off the road, it's really good. And, and knobs are very tactile, and, and if you have like the round mouse and everything, that's great. You know, touch screens, you got to look at the screen to see where you're going to touch. You know, I know that's fancy everything, but you are driving a car. You can't lose sight of that. And I think, um, Steve, you said it give, give the choice, but you have to simplify it. And I think if you find a solution that's a combination of knobs and different things, 
uh, you'll be fine. One thing that I'm concerned about for the industry, putting all this technology in cars, especially for emissions, safety, and fuel economy, the price keeps going up. I mean, the way I've been tracking it, it looks like car prices on average are going up almost $1,000 a year right now. The average MSRP, you know, the sticker price is over 30 grand. That's too much for most American households. Is, is this a concern for you on the retail side of the business as you've got to sell all these things? In the well, it's, it's a great concern. Uh, the question uh, is very much the added value to the consumer for the increase in price. If you look at the strides that have been made in safety, it's, it's an amazing story. You know, the fatality rate in the U.S. used to be five deaths per 100 million miles. We're now almost down to one death per 100 million miles. Still too high, but technology ha has gotten us uh, there. But when you see things like the CAFE requirements of 54 miles per gallon, which is going to push the cost of the vehicle higher much faster than you can justify the return, there is genuine risk that there will be a disconnect and that industry volumes will fall, economies of scale will be lost. You slow down the, the turnover of the fleet that's in service in the U.S., you keep in service, older, less fuel efficient, dirtier cars longer because you've pushed the price of the new car too far, too fast. So there is real concerns in the industry about uh, the, the level of requirement, what's it doing uh, for the cost of the vehicle, and will ultimately be society be better because regulation pushed the industry selling rate from 16 million to 10? Well, that's an issue especially in an economy that you've pointed out a couple times already is is tepid and and has a lot of risks on the horizon I think you've talked a lot about the the fiscal cliff situation coming up and uh, your your concern about that I don't know if you'd want to kind of yeah of course into that um, here's the way I look at the US economy um, we had a economic Pearl Harbor in uh, the fall of 08 Emergency measures were taken that saved the day. It pains me as a Republican libertarian to say that Uncle Sam had to step in with TARP and things like that, but uh, the, the, the crisis was so big, the Uncle Sam was the only one that could save the day. But the, uh, from that, though, you needed a vibrant uh, recovery to, to get people back to work. And we haven't had a vibrant recovery. We had GDP growth of 2.5% in 2010, 1.8% in 2011, and it'll be less than that. Uh, in 2012. Now, here's the scary thing. That's with the biggest st stimulus program in the history of mankind. On the monetary side, interest rates are at zero, have been at zero since the crisis, and the Federal Reserve is saying they're going to keep them at zero uh, in, into 2015. And they've expanded the Fed's balance sheet from a trillion, a trillion five. They're, they're on a march towards four trillion. And on the fiscal side, we've had five trillion of deficit spending in the last four years. So those, that, to have those horrible numbers with that kind of stimulus is what's so frightening. You know, if you didn't have the stimulus, you would say, okay, not so good. But it's sort of like if you had somebody who was very fit and, and had a heart attack, you went into the hospital. And... Um, emergency measure saved you, and now you've been on your rehab program for four years, including massive uh, steroid shots, and you still can't get out of bed. You're still lying there like this. Eventually, the steroids can kill you. You can't keep doing this. So that's the concern uh, with the economy, and um, the economy is so not in, in strong enough shape to take any shock. The fiscal cliff would be a shock. It would immediately put us back uh, into recession, and people are, are in a period of massive uncertainty with this type of recovery, are looking to Washington, D.C., and they see a dysfunctional city, and it's scary. And, and, and so this cloud of uncertainty is a weight on the economy. Well, the patient isn't ready to run the marathon, that's for sure. <laughs> can, can I, let me, Mike, ask you an auto nation question. You know, for years, people have come up to me periodically and said, you know what the future of auto retailing is? a big box store like a Walmart and they're going to have 
cars sold next to each other, different brands. This would be the SUV section of, you know, Dodge, Ford, uh, Chevy, and this would be the small car section. This would be the mid-car section. That's the future of auto retailing. After a while, you say, well, it's not such a new idea, but AutoNation, in some people's mind, was going to fulfill that dream. Why hasn't that dream been fulfilled, or if you want to call it a dream, and why hasn't AutoNation done what people thought it was going to do when it first well, formed? Uh, I would call it a fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly wasn't my dream. <laughs> I would tell you it's not going to happen. I'll tell you why. So manufacturers uh, invest tremendous uh, fixed capital in development, uh, in factories, uh, and in brand marketing. And they view the experience that the consumer gets at retail as part of the brand. And, you know, from a manufacturer point of view, as you look at the, uh, the increase in quality and design and everything, the ability to differentiate, differentiate becomes more and more difficult. So they want a um, freestanding, exclusive facility. So here's the deal. Manufacturer says to us, listen, you want to sell our Chevys? Give us an exclusive facility. We'll give you a protected territory. And that's the quid pro quo. You could call it with the deal with the devil, but that's the deal. And uh, that's uh, uh, the basis uh, for the industry. It has worked well for the consumer in that our gross margins on the sale of a vehicle is about 7%. And my costs are about 6%. So it's highly efficient for the manufacturer, highly efficient uh, for the consumer. And uh, you, you show me any other retail system that as, is, is, is efficient with those narrow margins. Plus, I take care of the car. I build the facilities, take care of the car uh, uh, for the warranty period. Now, if you ask me what my vision for AutoNation is, that's, I can give you that answer. Yes, what's your vision for AutoNation? <laughs> uh, here's what I see. <laughs> I see this uh, consumer in America today that's been empowered by uh, the digital world and all the devices that come with it. And uh, they love all the freedom and choice that this gives them. It's been uh, transformational in other industries, whether it's books or entertainment or travel. Uh, while they love all their choice, they're very impatient it didn't create more time. It gave them less time. They're busier than ever. And the idea that when it comes time to buy a car or have it cared for, they're going to go backwards a decade or two or a century into a Byzantine process that is mind-boggling and painful is a big disconnect. So we say as a company, we have the ambition, we have the scale, we have the vision to say, how do we embrace this digitally empowered customer and create the ability to interact with that customer whichever way they want and give them high added value and enjoyment every step of the way. And they're in charge every step of the way. Now that's, a very, that's even more ambitious than your first goal, <laughs> almost more complicated than your first goal, but that's what we as a company are doing. And we're investing heavily in it um, still have tons of work to do, but I'm convinced we'll achieve that goal. Talking about the future of AutoNation, uh, the Chinese keep eyeing this market. In fact, I see a company called uh, Guangzhou Automotive Corporation, GAC, is going to be exhibiting at the Detroit Auto Show. Would AutoNation be interested in getting a Chinese franchise? I will not be a first adopter of a Chinese car. <laughs> I will not be a first mover on a Chinese car. I'll let somebody else go over the cliff with that. Is it a uh, quality issue? I think it's a quality and uh, safety issue, a sustainability mm -hmm. issue. And if our name goes on it, I have to stand behind it, regardless of what ultimately uh, happens. So I don't see any evidence that the Chinese manufacturers have any idea of what the expectations of the American consumers are uh, when it comes to safety, quality, and uh, how you interact with a vehicle and what the content of the, of the vehicle is. And so uh, let somebody else have all the fun. Well, I don't quick, think I'm going to be missing anything. Talking <laughs> about people entering the market, what about Suzuki leaving the market? Was that 
surprise. Do you have any Suzuki dealership? If, if they, if I do, they were hiding it from me because <laughs> uh, <laughs> they know. Listen, I'm, I'm, here, here's our here's our brand mix. We 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 love volume domestics. There'll always be a Chevy. There'll always be a Ford. Uh, we have Chrysler. Uh, we're big with the Asians, the big Asians, Nissan, Toyota, Honda, Hyundai. Uh, and we love premium German. Any premium German is, uh, is a very differentiated product with a very differentiated price. Anything else, they hide from me because I'll tell them to sell it. <laughs> so if there was a Suzuki left, I'll have to call the office and check. But I, I don't think so. Real quick, we're down to the, the last minute here. Uh, Besides the premium Germans, you've got a lot of Lexus stores, too. Cadillac and Lincoln are trying to revive themselves. Do you think you'd have any interest in them in the future? We, we, we have uh, some Cadillac and Lincoln, but I think the two centers of gravity that I see in the marketplace are, are, the, are the following. In the volume market, the American consumer today is able to get uh, what basically used to be a luxury car today in the volume market. If you look at the quality of the design, the vehicle, the content, the innovation, that's a luxury car. And, the, and here's the insight. The consumer is very comfortable that it's a Ford or a Chevy or a Toyota. And then the other center of gravity is the premium luxury from the Germans. Unbelievable differentiated uh, vehicle with an unbelievable different. Those are the two centers of gravity. In between is a no man's land where it's, it's tough. It's tough. You either got to run towards the Germans or face up to what the volume market's doing. And with that, we're going to have to wrap it up. Mike Jackson, thanks so much for coming in. Chairman and CEO of AutoNation, Craig Trudell, uh, Steve Finley as well. I want to thank uh, you, and I want to thank all of you, too, for having tuned in to AutoLine This Week. AutoLine This Week is underwritten in part by True Car and by... Did you know advanced high-strength steels are the leading material used by automakers to achieve the new fuel economy standards? Advanced high-strength steels are lighter in weight and reduce greenhouse gas emissions without compromising safety, performance, or affordability. Steel, a sound, sustainable investment. Today, tomorrow, and beyond. For more information, visit autosteel.org. Why? Because plants need water to grow. Because baseball's played in the summer. Oxygen and hydrogen. Because I forgot to get a receipt. Why? Why not? Why? Why don't you go ask your dad? Do Sonata drivers know something you don't? The Sonata from Hyundai.